This is a personal political broadcast by Ellie Harrison. Hello and welcome to this bland and anonymous hotel room here slap bang in the middle of England. My name is Ellie Harrison and this is my personal political broadcast coming to you live on election day. The day that people all over the UK get the chance to vote in the first nationwide election, the first nationwide referendum rather, since the 6th of June 1975, and the first time that I get to vote in the Scottish parliamentary elections since moving to Glasgow just two and a half years ago. This isn't propaganda, this is going to be my personal story. I was born in the London Borough of Ealing on the 11th of March 1979. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Um, Hello again and welcome to this bland and anonymous hotel room that I'm stuck in here in the centre of England. My name is Ellie Harrison and this is my personal political broadcast coming to you live on election day. The day that people all over the UK get to vote in the first nationwide referendum since the 6th of June 1975 and the day that the people of Wales and the people of Scotland get to vote in their own uh, national elections for the regional assemblies and parliaments. It's an exciting day for me because it's the first time that I get to vote in the Scottish parliamentary elections since moving to Glasgow just two and a half years ago. This isn't propaganda, this is my personal story. I was born in the London Borough of Ealing on the 11th of March 1979. Now 32 years later I feel confused about my identity. I'm your archetypal child of the 80s you see, I'm one of Thatcher's brood. Growing up I remember it all seemed to be about Britain, about the Union, about our United Kingdom. I saw a flag waving on the telly and it felt patriotic. Despite the fact that this Britain they talked about didn't even have a football team, something that confused me through numerous World Cups, Italia 90 being the most memorable, when a team called Scotland did remarkably well in my memory and a little known team called England made it all the way to the semi-finals. But prior to this, in the 1980s, it all seemed to be about Britain. Britain was the buzzword. As you may recall, there was British Rail and British Gas, British Telecoms and British Steel. There was the National Electricity Board, the National Coal Board and the National Health Service. These were publicly owned nationwide industries which you might argue held our country together, gave it a coherent sense of identity. But as we all know, this family silver was just too valuable to be left safely in the cupboard. And it was this very same woman, this woman who was so anti-devolution, who set about, knowingly or not, fracturing and dismantling our country's infrastructure and selling it off piece by piece. Under the Labour governments of the 1970s, the devolution of the UK's constituent countries was a hot topic. It all came to a head just 10 days before my birth on the 1st of March 1979, when the people of Wales and the people of Scotland were first given the opportunity to vote on the issue. But what happened was draconian 40% um, majority clauses that were imposed on this referendum result meant that the yes vote for Scotland was shouted down. And in Wales, the best known politician ran a frantic no campaign trying to persuade the Welsh people that it wouldn't be a good idea. Then just two months after this, Thatcher stormed to power amidst the sea of union jack waving maniacs 
and the issue of devolution was put to, get, put to bed for some 18 years. Under Tory rule, power was, would remain uh, firmly in Westminster, and Wales and Scotland were set to remain marginalised countries. Until the next Labour government, the new Labour government, came to power and again put the idea of devolution to the people's vote. In September 1997, the people of Scotland, my new adopted home, as well as the people of Wales, the country of my family's heritage, finally voted yes to devolution and to the setting out of the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly. On paper, it all seems to make sense. Finally, these marginalised countries have autonomy over their own policy in the areas known as devolved matters. They can decide what to do about health and education, environment, housing, police, fire services, sports, arts, transport, etc. They can now better represent and act in the interests of the people who actually live in these countries. But I see other benefits in setting up these new parliamentary systems. These are benefits that come with the centuries of experience, and hindsight of course, that we have in this country of trying to slowly and incrementally make a fairer democracy. And so when they finally opened in 1999, it seemed a lot of thought had gone into what the best and fairest structure for the Welsh Assembly and the Scottish Parliament should be. If you look carefully at how the systems work, you'll see they're set up as though the governments are small, hypothetical republics. They give us a glimpse, a glimpse of what, at what democracy in the United Kingdom might look like without the hangovers of the aristocracy. In the Welsh Assembly and in the Scottish Parliament, there's no House of Lords to speak of. It's the commoners who fill the seats in the main chambers and it's the commoners who have the final say-so. Their decisions are informed by advice which they take from specialist committee groups. And since Wales voted yes in their second referendum on devolution just a few months ago in March, the Welsh Assembly can finally make its own laws without the say-so of Westminster. On paper, it's like a utopian dream. It's like paradise. It really is the people's government. But there's one small problem, there's one small problem still getting in the way, and it looks a little bit like this. As much as I enjoyed my state-imposed bank holiday last Friday, I'm sure you all did too, it has to be said that it's the continued existence of the monarchy in this country which makes true democracy impossible. Any laws which are passed by the Welsh Assembly and the Scottish Parliament have to be then given to the British monarch for royal assent. The monarch still holds these powers known as the prerogative, which can be exercised at the w without the will of the people. And although Queenie has long since passed down her prerogative powers to the Parliament in Westminster, it still symbolises the fact that power in the UK is handed down from above from the monarch and not loaned from below from the people as it should be in a true democracy. The UK government still has these supreme prerogative powers which it can use at its whim and so it does. For example like starting unnecessary wars with Middle Eastern countries against the will of the people as we've seen on numerous occasions. But this brings me to the UK government and its role in all of this. It still holds the supreme powers as, as the master of the Welsh Assembly and the Scottish Parliament. It won't let these devolved governments control what it calls reserved matters. These are foreign affairs, defence, immigration, social security, etc. Which perhaps makes sense given that we are just a small island uh, in the end. But the ridiculous thing I see in all of this is that it's the UK government that's the dinosaur here. It's the UK government where the hangovers to the aristocracy are still ever present. It's the UK government that still holds the power um, to act with top-down authoritarianism. 
The fact that only 36.1% of UK citizens actually voted for the Conservative Party in 2010 is enough evidence for me that this in no way re resembles the People's Government. And so it seems it's the structure of the UK Parliament which seems most in need of urgent reform. Which brings me quite neatly to today's referendum. Today's referendum offers us the opportunity to have our say on how we elect our MPs to Parliament. This could have been an opportunity, perhaps, to bring the UK's archaic parliamentary structure up to date and in line with the newer fairer systems in use in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. But alas, no, it seems this opportunity could be wasted. We all know the story. We're being asked to choose between two voting systems. One's called first past the post, one's called the alternative vote. But the ridiculous thing is, neither of these systems are the systems that they chose to use to elect members to the Welsh Assembly or the Scottish Parliament. They use a system called the additional member system, right? Where you get two votes per person. One's to elect the person you want to represent your constituency and the others to elect the person you want to represent your region, right? It's a bigger area and um, there's five regions in Wales and there's eight in Scotland and the votes that are cast um, for each region are then totted up and allocated proportionately so that the number of people from each party actually re re reflects the percentage of votes that party got. Sounds fair to me. So it seems that the miserable little compromise in all of this is the referendum question itself. It seems that it's the refer referendum question itself that's deliberately obscure dreamt up in a back room by Cameron and Clegg when they signed that CD deal almost one year ago. It's the question which is deliberately avoiding the real issue. They're spending hundreds of thousands of pounds trying to persuade us to say no, right? And they're spending hundreds of thousands of pounds, although obviously not quite as much, but still a lot, trying to persuade us to say yes. But the crazy thing is, no matter which system wins, we're still going to be left with a voting system that's inconsistent with those used in Wales and Scotland. So no wonder I'm not the only one who seems a little confused about the relationships between the UK's constituent countries. Because it seems that until we have a standard, consistent, fair and democratic way of voting, but also of decision making in all of the UK's parliaments and assemblies, how's it ever truly going to make sense? But regardless of the compromise of the choice that we're being presented with today in the referendum, a yes vote still is an acknowledgement that something's got to change, right? Otherwise, there's no doubt that the Tories will use a no vote in today's referendum as a no to electoral reform full stop. And just as happened in the referendum on devolution back in 1979, they'll then not likely give us a chance to vote for change for another 18 years. That was a personal political broadcast by Ellie Harrison.